Harry and Hermione, this is in the chapter of the life and lies of Albus Dumbledore. Harry and Hermione have been... Um, Harry and Hermione have read the article about Dumbledore. And we left off the other day with, you know, how on page 293 in the British one, which I don't remember what page it is in the American one, it's... Somewhere around two fifty, uh, three fifty-seven or so, three fifty-eight. Um, we're told Harry had trusted Dumbledore, he believed him, the embodiment of goodness and wisdom, all was ashes. Blah 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 blah. Okay, and so they start arguing over what this means about what they really knew of Dumbledore. And Hermione says, you know, the the thing about Grindelwald, yeah, that's the worst part. I mean, I know Batilda thought it was all just talk, but for the greater good became Grindelwald's slogan. His justification for all the atrocities he committed. And it's part of the utilitarian manifesto, which is essentially, um, you do whatever is for the greatest good for the greatest number. So if it were in the greatest good of the largest number in this class uh, for me to just pull something out of the air, then according to utilitarianism, that's what I should do. If I should say everybody from, you know, these two rows to this side of the class, you know, should pass and those on the other side should fail, then that would be the greatest good. You can see how lopsided this idea is. And it's very Hitlerian. Okay? Um, notice she says they saved for the greater good was even over the entrance to Nurmengard. Nurmengard was Grindelwald's fortress. And Harry asks, well, what was that? It was the prison Grindelwald had built to hold his opponents. It's not an accident that she uses that name Nurmengard because it sounds like Nuremberg which is where the trials were held for Nazis after World War II. Okay? And they keep talking, and Harry's just, you know, really having a hard time with Dumbledore. And Hermione finally says, He changed, Harry. He changed. It's as simple as that. Maybe he did believe those things when he was 17. But the whole of the rest of his life was devoted to fighting the dark arts. Dumbledore was the one who stopped Grindelwald, the one who always voted for muggle protection and muggle-born rights, who fought you know who from the start and who died trying to bring him down. What is she, Hermione, and she, Rowling, saying? Everyone can change. It's not who we're born, as Dumbledore tells Cornelius Fudge, but who we grow to be. Okay? It's our choices, Harry, that show who we are, far more than our abilities. Think of Dumbledore's abilities. Think of Grindelwald's abilities. And think of what they do with their choices. Think of Voldemort's abilities. Think of what he does with his choices. Think of Snape's abilities. Think of what he does with his choices. Okay? Hermione, Harry, I'm sorry, but I think the real reason you're so sorry is that Dumbledore never told you any of this himself. Maybe I am. Look what he asked for me, Hermione. Risk your life, Harry, and again and again. And don't expect me to explain everything. Just... Trust me blindly. Okay, that's another phrase for have faith. Have faith in me, Harry. And don't expect me to explain everything. Just trust me blindly. Trust that I know what I'm doing. Trust me even though I don't trust you. Never the whole truth. Never. When do we ever have the whole 
truth. Court of law does not convict people based on the whole truth. What does it have to have? Does it have to have proof? It has to be beyond a shadow of doubt. In other words, there can still be some doubt, but it can, there can never be, okay, what Rowling is suggesting here, the whole truth. We never understand someone's motives entirely. And that's part of the truth. His voice cracked with the strain. They stood looking at each other in the whiteness and the emptiness. Harry felt that they were as insignificant as insects beneath that wide sky. Okay, now notice that. <clears throat> the sky is described as white. Where they are is described as empty. It's like it's a void. They're in a, a no man's land. And Harry feels like they are bugs in the grand scheme of the universe. What he's feeling is essentially nihilism. That there's no point, there's no point to life. There's no reason for existing. There's no reason for Harry having been born. All just complete chance. Okay? So he's wrestling with this. Hermione, he loved you. I know he loved you. I don't know who he loved, Hermione, but it was never me, blah, 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 blah. Okay? Now what happens in the very next chapter? Or let me rephrase that. Let me go back. Notwithstanding what I said up here. What is Harry feeling when he felt that they were as insignificant as insects beneath that wide sky? What's he feeling? Other than like an insect beneath that wide sky. Despair. 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 Complete, total despair. He feels completely meaningless. All right? The silver doe. They disapparate and go somewhere else. They go to the forest of Dean. Next chapter. Why? Because that's where J.K. Rowling used to play as a child. Snow is all over the ground, we're told. And this is somewhere around 364, 363, 265 maybe. And Harry is, we're told, felt as though he is recuperating from some brief but severe illness. An impression reinforced by Hermione's solicitousness. <laughs> She's trying to make things well for him. After two nights of little sleep, Harry's senses seem more alert than usual. What kind of happens sometimes if you don't sleep well? Come on, you've turned in papers, you know, after not sleeping, and yeah, you're all jumpy and jittery, right? So Harry goes out to sit at the front of the tent, and we're told in the paragraph that begins several times he jerked upright that he felt suspended in limbo between disapparition and apparition. Held up his hand just to make sure he's really there, and he sees a bright light appear in the road ahead of him, or in the ahead of him. He looks again, and then the source of the light stepped out from behind an oak. It was a silver white doe, moon bright, dazzling, picking her way over the ground, still silent, leaving no hoof prints in the fine powdering of snow. In other words, this isn't Bambi, nor Bambi's mother. Her inexplicable familiarity, he felt that he had been waiting for her to come, but they had forgotten until this moment that they had arranged to meet. So what does he do? He follows it. He leaves the protection that Hermione weaves for him. But instinct, overwhelming instinct, told him this wasn't dark magic. And he goes off after it. 
And through the darkness, though the darkness had swallowed her whole, her burnished image was still imprinted on his retinas. It obscured his vision, brightening when he lowered his eyelids, disorientating him. Now fear came. Her presence had meant safety. Why? Because the doe leads him off into the dark forest and then disappears. And what does he see? He sees where she disappeared. Something gleamed in the light of the wand, and Harry spun about, but all that was there was a small frozen pool, its cracked black surface glittering as he raised the wand higher to examine it. He moves forwards, and what does he see beneath the thick, crusty carapace of ice? A great silver cross. His heart skips into his mouth. Notice, we are left with this image of a great silver cross for a few seconds. We don't get anything added to it. We don't get any clarification. All right? His heart skipped into his mouth. He dropped to his knees at the pool's edge, angled the wand. So he's sitting there on his knees, pointing the wand, trying to get the light to shine down. A glint of deep red. It was a sword with glittering rubies in its hilt. So a great silver cross with glittering red. Well, if you've ever been to a museum that has one, it's pretty standard fare in the Middle Ages for there to be crosses made of gold or silver and to be encrusted with rubies. Why rubies? Because they signify Christ's blood. Okay? And keep in mind, this is Godric Gryffindor's sword. But it's the sword not looking at the blade. It's the sword looking at the hilt and the handle that protects the hands. The sword of Gryffindor was laying at the bottom of the forest pool. Okay, so notice, how did Harry find this? A deer led him to the cross in the pool. This is a variant of the myth or story of St. Eustace. St. Eustace, who goes off into a forest after a vision and sees a stag, not a doe, but a stag carrying Christ in its antlers. Okay? A cross is the symbol of Christ. So he's looking at it. Why, why is he thinking, oh, cool. Why, what's so significant about Gryffindor's sword? It can destroy horcruxes, and it's his. Dumbledore left it to him in his will. Okay? So what does Harry do? Oxio sword. He tries the easy way out. Tries to use magic. Stored doesn't move. Okay? So then what does he do? He says, uh, help. He murmured. <clears throat> but the sword remained upon the pool, bottom indifferent, motionless. Notice how he says help. He murmurs it. Why? Why is it a murmur? What is his saying of help here? How is his saying of help here different than when he cries for help in the Chamber of Secrets? Okay. Where is he praying it? Here or there? Where does help come? There. Chamber of Secrets. Help will always come. Dumbledore says, if it's asked for, etc. What else? Okay. He's more believing in help in Chamber of Secrets. When he cries for help here, I think that he's not really expecting any help to come. He's kind of saying, help me, Lord, and not really believing that any help is coming. 
So Harry thinks, what was it? Dumb what did Dumbledore say? Only a true Gryffindor could have pulled that out of the hat? Well, when did that happen? Chamber of Secrets. So he thinks, hmm, what do I have to do? i got to go down in that water. It's cold. Crusted over with ice. So he walks around it a couple times. And so he starts to take his clothing off. He does defendo. He cracks the ice. And what does he do? It cracked with a sound like a bullet in the silence. The surface of the water broke. Harry could judge it's not deep, but he'd have to submerge himself completely because he's going to have to reach down with his hand. He can't, you know, pick it up with his feet. So he keeps thinking about it, but it doesn't make the water any warmer. And he jumps in. Every pore of his body screamed in protest. The very air in his lungs seemed to freeze solid as he was submerged to his shoulders in the frozen water. Notice what he doesn't do. He doesn't dive in, and he doesn't jump in and go all the way under at once and reach for it. He jumps in just enough for the water to come up to here. He could hardly breathe, trembling so violently. He puts off the moment of total submersion. Cold was agony. It attacked him like fire. How can cold attack you like fire? Aren't those opposites? No, it's painful to be cold. I worked in a freezer all the time. Okay. Painful. How painful? It it's, feels like you're being stabbed. Yeah, it's stabbing. It's a stabbing pain. And I've been on fire before, and it's not a pleasant experience. I've been freezing and on fire, not at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Then something closed tight around his neck. But when does that happen? He pushes through the dark water to the bottom, reaches out, he grubs for the sword. His fingers close around the hilt. As soon as his fingers close around the hilt, the chain on his neck tightens. The chain of the Horcrux had tightened. It was slowly constricting his windpipe. He kicks out wildly, trying to kick himself back to the surface. But he can't. Harry had no strength to lift his head and see his savior's identity because somebody pulled him out. Are you mental? Notice the language that's used. Not his rescuer's identity, his savior's identity. Who is it? The most unlikely savior you would find. Ron. Why the hell, Ron says, didn't you take this thing off before you dived? Because Harry wasn't thinking. Okay? So they talk about the doe and the stag and Ron Stag and all this kind of stuff. And um, what's the significance of Harry having to get the sword out of the water? Shows he's a true Gryffindor. Okay, shows he's a true Gryffindor. What else? Okay. Okay. Keep going. Why does he have to go all the way under? It's a baptism image. And notice what almost happens to him. What is baptism? It's symbolic of death and resurrection. Harry goes under, he grabs the cross, the hilt of the sword of Godric Gryffindor, and what happens? He starts to die. And then his Savior rescues him. Okay? It's not accidental that Rowling does this. And there is a tradition, by the way, in some churches, on what's called the Feast of Epiphany, which is the twelfth day after Christmas, okay? where a priest or preacher will take a cross when they have this thing called the blessing of the waters. They'll take the cross and they'll throw it into the water for young men to dive in and get it out. Now, it's great if you're in Tarpon Springs, Florida, you know, where the water is 75 degrees. And, you know. But if you're in Russia, it could really suck. <laughs> or Scotland or somewhere else where it's cold all the time. Okay? So they get the locket, uh, excuse me, they get the sword, they break the locket open. I don't even want to talk about the, 
<laughs> Idiotic stuff they do in the film. And Hermione comes and sees Ron and everything. And notice she's ready to forgive him. Not. <laughs> Why not? Because he left. Why else? Yes. the gold crutches. <laughs> I wasn't going to say it. Okay. So we get the chapter Xenophilius Love Good. They go to talk to Xenophilius. Um, I got to skip a bunch. Because Hermione knows he has some answers that they need. Because he was wearing the cloak or the robe with the mark on it. So they go and talk to him. And he says, the very last chapter, very last page, Hermione talks about the symbol, and he says, oh, are you referring to the sign of the Deathly Hallows? Uh, excuse me? The Deathly Hallows? That's right. You haven't heard of them? One simply uses the symbol to reveal oneself to other believers in the hope that they might help one with the quest. A symbol to reveal yourself to other believers? Sound like any other symbol? You know, the fish or the Darwin eating the fish or the fish eating Darwin, which, okay. The cross? Uh, Harry says, I don't understand. Well, you see, believers seek the deathly hallows. Hermione, but what are they? And she pulls out the tales of Beetle the Bard. And... They read the story, okay? And Hermione says, um, well, it's just a story. And Xenophilius says around page 406 or so, uh, that, is a, that is a children's tale told to amuse rather than to instruct. Those of us who understand these matters, however, recognize that the ancient story refers to these objects or hallows, which, if united, will make the possessor master of death. And Hermione's like, right. She says, but how could you possibly believe? Luna has told me all about you, young lady. You are, I gather, not unintelligent, but painfully limited narrow, close-minded. Well, notice what Hermione has just said. How can you possibly believe? And so he calls her close-minded. Ron, maybe you should try on the hat. So she goes, okay, we know there are invisibility clothes. Harry has one. They're rare, but he goes, no, but the third hallow is a true cloak of invisibility. We're talking about a cloak that really and truly rend renders the wearer completely invisible, endures eternally, giving constant and impenetrable concealment, no matter what spells are cast at it. How many cloaks have you ever seen like that, Miss Granger? <laughs> How many invisibility cloaks did Moody have? So how rare can they be if Moody has two? Okay. No, that's true. So Hermione goes, okay, okay. Say the cloak existed. What, what about the resurrection stone? What of it? How can that be real? Prove that it's not. Prove that the cloak is not real. Oh, excuse me. Prove that the stone is not real. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. Stop. <laughs> Hermione how can I possibly prove that it doesn't exist do you expect me to get hold of, of all the pebbles in the world and test them I mean you could claim that anything's real if the only basis for believing in it is that nobody's proved it doesn't exist he goes very good you're starting to open your mind a little Okay, notice he forces her to use logic. Why? Because that's all Hermione understands. She says, in response to his, prove that the resurrection stone isn't real. Well, how do I do that? 
Hermione's asking. Well, I'd have to take every stone and... You're right. You would. Extract from that to a larger thing. Prove that God doesn't exist. How do you do that? You go look everywhere that God might be? Harry, so the older one, you think that exists too? Oh, that's, yeah, definitely. He goes on. The possessor of the wand must capture it from its previous owner if he's to be truly master of it. And they go on and they talk about Elder Wand. So Xenophilius finally points out when Hermione says that they saw the symbol of the Deathly Hallows on Ignotus Peveril's, Peveril's grave, he says exactly the sign of the Deathly Hallows on Ignotus's grave is conclusive proof. Of what? Why, that the three brothers in the story were actually the three Peveril brothers, Antioch, Cadmus, and Ignotus, that they were the original owners of the Hallows. Now, I could be grasping at straws here, but look at those three names. Antioch, Cadmus, and Ignotus. Okay, first of all, they're all Greek origin. Okay? But these two particularly are related. Because Ignotus is just a different spelling for Ignatius. Ignatius was an early Christian saint. Okay? According to the tradition of the church, when Christ took a little child and put him on his lap and said, one must become like a child to enter the kingdom of heaven. That child was St. Ignatius of Antioch. Ignatius, Antioch, two brothers' names. Okay. Again, I don't think it's an accident that she does things like that. I don't know necessarily what it means. I just don't think it's an accident. So, they keep talking, page 414, and they're talking about the tale, and Hermione says, it's just a morality tale. This is page 414 in the American edition. It's obvious which gift is best, which one you choose. And they each speak at the same time. Hermione says, the cloak? Why would Hermione want to be invisible? So she could learn more? She's kind of had her days for sure he was anyway. So. Okay. What is she always doing in class? <coughs> Everybody knows how smart Hermione is. Do you think maybe Hermione would like a little anonymity? Okay. Ron says the wand. Why? Harry, the stone, and he could finally see his parents. You're supposed to say the cloak, Ron told Hermione, but you would need to be invisible if you had the wand. An unbeatable, come on, Hermione. Harry, we've got an invisibility cloak. It's helped us rather a lot, and didn't you notice? Okay. So, they ask about Luna, and then they escape and we get to chapter 22 the deathly hallows and around page 425 or so they're talking about the story and Hermione says well I don't suppose it matters but even if he was being honest I never heard such a load of nonsense in all my life why would Hermione consider the story a lot of nonsense Okay. What kind of book is the Tales of Beetle the Word? Children's story. It's a children's story. And Hermione is what? She's 17. I'm an adult now. I don't read kids' books. Can you Rowling, like, like use Tolkien's usage of it, like myths and belief of it? Like to the point where like myths don't have any like real hold in this world, I guess, like uh, Tolkien and... Uh, what's his face argued about? And he wrote Mythopoeia or whatever. Right, Tolkien and Lewis, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I think she kind of shares Tolkien's 
views. Okay, Ron, hang on. Chamber of Secrets was supposed to be a myth. Yeah, that was real. <laughs> Hermione, but the Deathly Hallows can't exist, Ron. Why? Because in order, in according to my logical understanding of the world, it doesn't fit. That's why. Ron, you keep saying that. But one of them can. I mean, Harry's invisible. But the tale of the three brothers is a story. It's a story about how humans are frightened of death. That's all it is. Anthropologists tell us that. Anthropologists tell us that ancient societies, you know, or people 25,000 years ago who were drawing paintings of bison and ox and deer and horses on the caves of Lascaux, France, were actually worshiping these things. And they tell us that, and it must be real. And it's a bunch of bullshit. We don't know why they were painting those things on the caves in France. Okay? What Rowling is saying is maybe children's stories are more than just children's stories, like Tolkien says. Harry, I don't know what we could do with an unbeatable wand. There's no such thing, Harry. You said there have been loads of wands. The death stick, whatever. But if you wanted to kid yourself, the elder wand's real. What about the resurrection stone? Okay, so what has she just, what have they just gotten her to do? They admitted the possibility of two of the three. If two of the three are real, what does that say about the third one? Most likely it is real. When my wand connected with you know who's, it made my mom and dad appear and Cedric. But they weren't really back from the dead, were they? Those kinds of pale imitations aren't the same as truly bringing someone back to life? No, they aren't the same as bringing someone back to life, but what did they show? They're still there somewhere. But she, the girl in the tale, didn't really come back, did she? Notice who's been actually listening to the tale, not Hermione. The story says that once people are dead, they belong with the dead, but the second brother still got to see her and talk to her, didn't he? He even lived with her for a while. In other words, they're not totally dead. They're not disembodied particles. They aren't, if you've read Philip Pullman's His Dark Materials series, they're not what happens to you when you die. According to Philip Pullman, what happens to you when you die is your body disintegrates. And when your body disintegrates, you, the animating spirit, the soul, the consciousness, whatever you want to call it, also disintegrates. Nothing goes on after that point. Right? Harry says, um, so you don't know, or Ron says, you don't know anything about the guy buried in Godric's Hollow? Hermione, no. Okay. So they keep talking, and Harry's thinking of one of his lessons with Dumbledore. Peveril, ministry official, Marvolo gone. What? Marvolo Gaunt, you know who's grandfather in the pensive. Marvolo Gaunt said he was descended from the Peverils. Ron and Hermione are clueless. The ring, the ring that became the Horcrux. Marvolo Gaunt said it had the Peveril coat of arms on it. I saw him waving it in the blood from the ministry's face. Hermione, what coat of arms? Could you see what it looked like? No. Do you think it was this sign? Harry, could have been. Okay. So they keep talking. And Harry finally figures out the resurrection stone. It's here. No, not the stone. The ring. It's in the snitch. But it's not in the snitch. Okay? So, um, they go on. Let's see here. This is page 352. Somewhere around 432. Harry's thinking. He's got first watch. Actually, Hermione has first watch. And Harry's thinking, I opened at the close. But what was the close? 
And the one, the elder one, he's thinking about that now. He wished his scar would burn so he would know Voldemort's thoughts, but there's nothing there. But then Hermione wouldn't like that idea, of course. Why? She did not believe. Notice, Harry believes now in the Deathly Hallows. He doesn't believe in Dumbledore, but he believes in the Deathly Hallows. Xenophilius had been right. She was limited, narrow, closed-minded. And then they're thinking of Luna. And Harry thinks if only they could rescue her. They packed up the tent the next morning and moved on through a dreary shower of rain. The downpour pursued them to the coast, where they pinched the tent that night, persisted through the whole week. He could only think of the Deathly Hallows. It was as though a flame had been lit inside him. Then nothing, not Hermione's flat disbelief, nor Ron's persistent doubts could extinguish. Notice, this flame in Harry cannot be put out by Hermione's disbelief, nor by Ron's doubt. So what's the source of the flame? It's belief. It's faith in the hallows. Not because of anything Dumbledore has said. Just in the basis of what he's reasoned about them. And he goes on and he thinks about the quote from the cemetery. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And he's thinking about the silver doe. Um, even the mystery of the silver doe, which the other two insisted on discussing, seemed less important. His scar had begun to prickle. Though he tried to hide it, he sought solitude whenever it happened, was, but was disappointed by what he saw. The visions he and Voldemort were sharing had changed in quality. They'd become blurred, shifting as though they're moving in and out of focus. Harry was just about to make out the indistinct features of an object that looked like a skull. And something like a mountain that was more shadow than substance. Why? Why a skull in something that looked like a mountain? Well, can you think of any mountain that has something to do with a skull? Keep in mind what's already happened, how he found Gryffindor's sword. I think I'm completely grasping at straws here. Golgotha, the mountain, which means place of the skull. Okay. Um, they start listening to Potter Watch or talking about Potter Watch, and then they start listening to it. They hear Lee Jordan's voice and such. And somewhere around 437, 438, they hear Kingsley, and he says, Muggles remain ignorant of the source of their suffering as they continue to sustain heavy casualties. 440. 440. Why are they ignorant? Because they're the muggles. It's hidden from them. It's diagonal to them. They don't see things in the magical world. Because it is, as I did on the board that one day, it's kind of like that spiritual realm that they don't have eyes to see. Okay? And what do they hear? They hear Kingsley keep talking. And then he says, we're all human, aren't we? Every human life is worth the same and worth saving. Well, what's he talking about? Witches, wizards, and muggles. They're all worth the same. Okay? They hear Lupin, and Lupin goes on and talks about Harry. The boy who lived remains a symbol of everything for which we are fighting. The triumph of good, the power of innocence, the need to keep resisting. And notice, a mixture of gratitude and shame welled up in Harry. Right. And they get captured. Hermione hexes fairy. fairy. Hermione hexes fairy. Hermione's. Man. 
Hermione hexes Harry's face so that nobody can recognize him. He says he's Dudley. Okay. And where did you get taken to? Malfoy Manor. Well, what time of year is it? No. Around page 454, 455. Harry sees Narcissa Malfoy. She says, bring them in. Follow me. My son Draco is home for his Easter holidays. Notice how quickly the time is going by. If that is Harry Potter, he will know. So they bring Harry, they show him up close and personal Draco, and Draco says, can't be sure. Look at him carefully. Not sure. Okay. Harry saw Draco's face up close, now right beside his father's. They were extraordinarily alike, except that while his father looked beside himself with excitement, Draco's expression was full of reluctance, even fear. I don't know. Do you think Draco really didn't know? Or do you think Draco knew who it was and refused to turn him in? Okay. So, they send Ron and Harry down below. Hermione's going to stay upstairs and play with Greyback, Finrear, and Bellatrix. And Ron offers himself. And we hear Hermione get tortured. And around page 464 or so, Harry sees Wormtail. And Wormtail grabs him around the throat. And Harry says, you're going to kill me after I saved your life? You owe me, Wormtail. And the silver hand lets go. He saw the rat likes man's Small, watery eyes widen with fear and surprise. Why? It's not Wormtail letting him go. It's the silver hand. And what does the silver hand do? It latches on Wormtail. And Harry tries to save him. But they can't. Okay. And so Dobby rescues them. They go back and forth to Fleur in Bill's cottage, and we come to the last page of the chapter. Dobby, no, help, help. This time Harry bellows, <laughs> not a little murmur. He's really seeking help now. He did not know or care whether they were wizards or muggles, friends or foes. All he cared about was that a dark stain was spreading across Dobby's front and that he had stretched out his thin arms to Harry with a look of supplication. Dobby is standing there and he's going like this, like he's praying to Harry. Dobby, no, don't die, don't die. Harry Potter. <laughs> the elf had gone where he could not call him back. And what happens? We get this description of the sea rushing against rock, of people moving around, of Harry's scar prickling and burning. His rage was dreadful. That is Voldemort's. And yet Harry's grief for Dobby seemed to diminish it. So that it became a distant storm that reached Harry from across a vast, silent ocean. Go back to the epigraph at the beginning of the book. Death is but crossing the world as friends do the seas. Okay? And Harry says, I want to do it properly. Talking about speaking, talking about burying Dobby. Not by magic. What kind of creature is Dobby? House elf. He's a creature of magic. So why would not using magic be the proper way to bury Dobby. You would think, being a creature of magic, you know, burial, you know, and he'd be buried. That would be proper. But Harry says no. Why? 
Okay. It's something that everyone does, including muggles. Respect. It's something everyone does, including muggles. It's a form of closure, of saying goodbye. And so what happens? Bill gives him a spade. He shows him where to bury Dobby. And here he says, he, and we're told, he dug with a kind of fury, relishing the manual work, glorying in the non-magic of it. For every drop of his sweat and every blister felt like a gift to the elf, elf who had saved their lives. In other words, it is a form of repayment. It is a form of offering for Dobby. His scar burned, but he was master of the pain. What has Harry learned? Control. Control. Occlumency. He felt it, yet was apart from it. He had learned control at last, learned to shut his mind to Voldemort, the very thing Dumbledore had wanted him to learn from Snape. What did it take for Harry to learn the self-control? Losing Dobby? It's more than that. What's he doing when he's burying Dobby? He's shutting off the magic. In other words, he's tuning in let's say, to his muggle side. Keep in mind, Lily's parents were what? Muggles. Harry does have muggle blood in him. Okay? What else is he doing? He's shutting off his magical side, but he's opening up what side? Why is he burying Dobby this way? Because of love for Dobby. Okay? Just as Voldemort had not been able to possess Harry while Harry was consumed with grief for Sirius, so his thoughts could not penetrate Harry now while he mourned Dobby. Grief, it seemed, drove Voldemort out. Though Dumbledore, of course, would have said that it was love. N Notice, the narrator is telling us that Dumbledore would say, grief is love. Love is grief. Love is pain, in other words. Love is compassion, co-suffering for another. Harry dug deeper and deeper into the hard, cold earth, subsuming his grief in sweat, denying the pain in his scar. Well, what's he really doing? He's denying himself. He's denying everything he wants. Okay? He's emptying himself into this process of digging. He's pouring out all of his being into this. In the darkness with nothing but the sound of his own breath and the rushing sea to keep him company, the things that had happened at the Malfoys returned to him. The things he had heard came back to him, and understanding blossomed in the darkness. Why? What did he learn? That there's something in Bellatrix's vault. Okay? There's something in Bellatrix's vault. What else? It's a little bit more than that. And he thought of Wormtail, dead because of what? One small unconscious impulse of mercy. Dumbledore had foreseen that. How much more had he known? And what happens? That spark of belief and Dumbledore is relit. The doubt isn't erased, but the spark starts to glow a little brighter. The flame on the ashes starts to burn. Okay. Harry wraps Dobby in his jacket. Ron sits at the edge of the grave, strips off his shoes and socks which he puts upon Dobby's bare feet. Dean pulls out a woolen hat, which Harry placed carefully upon Dobby's head, muffling his bat-like ears. Notice, they each give Dobby a piece of clothing. Okay? We should close his eyes. They close his eyes. 
Luna, we ought to say something. I'll go first, shall I? Thank you so much, Toby, for rescuing me from that cellar. It's so unfair that you had to die when you were so good and brave. I'll always remember what you did for us. I hope you're happy now. Notice what Luna says. She speaks to Dobby like he's in the present tense. I hope you're happy now. Okay. But what else? It's unfair you had to die. And so it is. But it doesn't stop people from dying. Death happens. It happens at inopportune times. It happens at wrong moments. It happens unfairly. Yet it happens. Ron, yeah, thanks, Dobby. <laughs> Ron, ever the wordsmith. <laughs> Dean, thanks. Harry, goodbye, Dobby. And what does he do? He takes a stone and he writes on it. Here lies Dobby, a free elf. But notice how free Dobby is. He's not only free in the sense that he's not a slave, but he's free of pain and suffering. Is he, to use Luna's words, happy? Depends on if how selves go on. Okay. And Harry's mind, we're told, is full of those things that had come to him in the grave, ideas that had taken shape in the darkness, ideas both fascinating and terrible. And so he says to Bill, I need to talk to Griphook, and I need to talk to uh, Ollivander. He heard the authority in his voice, the conviction, the sense of purpose that had come to him. Dobby would never be able to tell them who had sent him to the cellar, but Harry knew what he had seen. A piercing blue eye had looked out of the mirror fragment, and then help had come. Help will always be given at Hogwarts to those who ask for it. He looks out over the ocean and feels closer this dawn than ever before, closer to the heart of it all. What does the it refer to? The closer, closer to the heart of what? It says he felt closer to the heart of it all. The heart of what? The heart of the ocean coming in, going out, coming in, going out? No. Probably, grasping at straws here, his purpose, the real meaning of the prophecy. He knew Voldemort was getting there too. Harry understood and yet did not understand. His instinct was telling him one thing, his brain quite another. The Dumbledore in Harry's head smiled, surveyed Harry over the tips of his fingers, pressed together as if in prayer. Here he has this image of Dumbledore looking at him, and his fingers are like this. Like he's going, come on, Harry, come on, Harry, come on, Harry. You can do it. Come on. Put it together, boy. You're smarter than this. And Harry thinks, am I meant to know but not to seek? Well, what happens to him when he arrives at Hogwarts and he's placed on the Quidditch team? He's not a knower. There is no position of knower. There is a position of seeker. Why? Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you, Christ says. Okay? Harry, am I meant to know but not to seek? Did you know how hard I'd find that? Is that why you made it this difficult? So I'd have to work that out. In other words, so I'd have to seek, to look? Yes. Yes. That is why Dumbledore did it that way. And he sits there and he thinks, and what happens? He sees the outline of Hogwarts. And he knows what Voldemort is doing. And he knows what part of him really wants to do. Go get the wand, but he doesn't. So instead, he talks, talks to Griphook and Ollivander. Okay? They talk about wands. They talk about the sword. Okay? 
And Harry tells Ron and Hermione there is a Horcrux in Bellatrix Lestrange's vault. And somewhere around uh, 478 or so, Harry's scar throbs because he made a decision. The decision was to speak to Griphook rather than apparate to Hogwarts. And he talks to Ollivander. And Ollivander says, I took this wand from Draco Malfoy by force. Can I use it? And he says, well, yeah. subtle laws govern wand ownership, but the conquered wand will usually bend its will to its new master. So if you want it, it's more likely to do your bidding. Do it well. Then another wand. Harry, so it's not necessary to kill the previous owner to take true possession? Well, no, not necessary. Okay. So he talks to, keeps talking to Ollivander and says, my wand beat the borrowed one that, that Voldemort was using. Your wand performed something unique that night. The connection of the twin cores is incredibly rare. Are talking about when he defeated Voldemort in the um, Goblet of Fire. Yet why your wand should have snapped the borrowed wand, I do not know. Okay. And then Ollivander says, the Dark Lord had always been happy with the wand I made him, you and Phoenix Feather, 13 and a half inches. Now he seeks another more powerful wand as the only way to conquer yours. Harry talks about Priori and Cantanum. Okay. And then Hermione says, finally, to Ollivander, so you don't think the whole Elder Wand thing's a fairy tale or myth? No. No. It's real. So, you get down to the end of that chapter, and Ron says, Dumbledore had the Elder One? Where's it now, Harry, at Hogwarts? Well, let's go get it. Too late. He knows where it is. He's there now. How long have you known? We could have gone. We could still go. Harry, no. Hermione's right. Dumbledore didn't want me to have it. He didn't want me to take it. He wanted me to get the Horcruxes. <coughs> Harry could have the ultimate weapon. No. Harry could have the ultimate power. No. No. Okay. And we see Voldemort go to Dumbledore's grave. Had the old fool imagined that marble or death would protect the wand? Had he thought that the Dark Lord would be scared to violate his tomb? The spider-like hand swooped and pulled the wand from Dumbledore's grasp. And as he took it, a shower of sparks flew from its tip, sparkling over the corpse of its last owner. Okay. Next chapter. The enormity of his decision... Not to race Voldemort to the wand still scared Harry. He could not remember ever before choosing not to act. What has he done throughout books one through six? As Hermione says, you know, Harry, you're always kind of playing the hero. So here he chooses not to be the hero. <coughs> Skip a few paragraphs. He felt that he was still groping in the dark. In other words, he doesn't have it all worked out. He had chosen his path but kept looking back, wondering if he'd misread the signs. How much is that like life? You make a decision and you go like, should, hmm, I wonder if that was the right decision. Whether or not he should have taken the other way. Okay. So now we're going to skip a bunch. Um, they go off to Gringotts. And we get a Warner Brothers theme park ride. Because that's pretty much what it is. I, I think by this time she was riding for the ride factor and the film factor. For some of it at least. We get the final hiding place, chapter 27. Okay, They get the cup. Chapter 28, The Missing Mirror. Um, let's see here. And Harry makes his way into the hogshead. 
Harry and Ron and Hermione. This is uh, sheesh. about page five. Is that one oh seven five fifty six five fifty eight. And Harry finally realizes it's not Albus Dumbledore I'm seeing in the mirror. It's Aberforth Dumbledore. You sent Dobby. Aberforth nods. Then you sent the dough. Nope. <laughs> what are you talking about? Somebody sent a dough Patronus. Brains like you? Brains like that? You can be a Death Eater, son. <laughs> Haven't I just proved my Patronus is a goat? You know, and he does the weird things with goats, too, so we're not going to talk about that. Okay? So what kind of good advice does Aberforth have for Harry? It's done. It's over. Quit. Let it go, boy, before you follow him. This is around 560. Save yourself. I can't. Why not? Well, you're fighting, too. You're in the order. The order of the Phoenix is finished. You know who's won. It's over. Harry, I can't. Dumbledore explained. Oh, did he now? Did Dumbledore explain you? Well, uh, Harry says, Elphias Doge mentioned her to us. That is, their sister, Ariana. Oh, did he? That old Burke. Harry kept quiet. He did not want to express the doubts and uncertainties about Dumbledore that had riddled him for months now. He had made his choice while he dug Dobby's grave. He decided to continue along the winding, dangerous path indicated for him by Albus Dumbledore to accept that he had been told everything that he wanted to know, not been told everything he wanted to know, but simply to trust. In other words, he had to have faith. And now he's got Dumbledore's brother trying to destroy that faith. Okay? And so what does Everforth do? He tells them about the day Ariana died, when Dumbledore and his best friend had an argument. And Grindelwald left, and Harry tells Aberforth, somewhere around uh, 664 or so, he was never free. 554? Sorry. What page? 560 <coughs> something? 567? He was never free. What? I beg your pardon? And here he's thinking about Dumbledore crying out when he's drinking the potion. So Aberforth says, you know, some things. And Hermione, I don't believe it. Dumbledore loved Harry. Why didn't he tell him to hide then? Why didn't he say to him, take care of yourself. Here's how to survive. Harry. Because sometimes you've got to think more about you. You've got to think about more than your own safety. Sometimes you've got to think about the greater good. This is war. Harry doesn't mean you've got to think about the greater good the way Dumbledore and Gellert Grindelwald talked about it. What does Harry mean? Sometimes you've got to be willing to sacrifice yourself. Okay? Sometimes... You've got to be willing to pay whatever con to take whatever consequences. Okay? You're 17, boy. I'm of age. And I'm not giving up. Who says I'm giving up? Okay? So Aberforth tells him about how you can get into the castle. And then what happens? People start pouring into the hogshead. Neville, Genie, etc. Okay? So they go into the castle to look for the diadem, and I'll skip that part, since we've only got 14, 16 minutes. Uh, you get the chapter, The Sacking of Severus Snape, and we see um, Amicus Caro insult McGonagall on around page 592 or so. He spits her, excuse me, spits in her face. Harry says, you shouldn't have done that. Crucio. And we have what happens to Amicus, and we hear, I see what Bellatrix meant. The blood thundering through his brain. You need to really mean it. Well, what else did she say? You have to like it. You have to enjoy it. 
Potter, Potter, that was foolish. He spat at you. Potter, I was very gallant of you. What's he doing? He's sticking up for manners. He's sticking up for McGonagall. Okay? The old bitty. <laughs> um, Percy comes back, admits to being a, how does he put it? An idiot, a pompous prat. I was a, and Fred lets him, Fred finishes for him. A ministry-loving, family-disowning, power-hungry power moron. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Percy agrees to that. Second to the last page of that chapter. So then we get the Battle of Hogwarts. Okay. Uh, we're going to skip a bunch. Harry talks to Rowena, uh, excuse me, Helena Ravenclaw. And we finally find out why the Bloody Baron is the Bloody Baron. It's not his blood. It's her blood that's all over him. And he wears chains. It's a penance for it. Okay? So, they go into the room of requirement to find the thing. And we get to the end of chapter 31. The air explodes, and Hermione's struggling to her feet in the wreckage, the very last page of that chapter. No, 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 Fred, no! Percy was shaking his brother. Ron was kneeling, and Fred's eyes staring at them, dead. The world had ended. I mean, if Fred is dead, it's got to be the second coming. Okay. Um, and here he goes. Let's see here. I gotta skip a bunch. Here he goes and witnesses Snape with Voldemort. And Voldemort tells Snape. But the Elder Wand cannot serve me properly, Severus, because I am not its true master. The Elder Wand belongs to the wizard who killed its last owner. You killed Albus Dumbledore. While you live, Severus, the Elder Wand cannot be truly mine. Notice where he's wrong in his logic. The Elder Wand doesn't belong to the person who killed its last owner. The Elder Wand belongs to who? The person who disarmed the owner of the Elder Wand. Well, who disarmed the owner of the Elder Wand? Malfoy. And then what happened? Harry disarmed Malfoy. Now, when Harry disarmed Malfoy, did he disarm Malfoy of the Elder Wand? No. Okay. But he still showed his supremacy. That's why Harry becomes the master. Do you think Harry knows that by now? Do you no. think that's why I asked all of No, I don't think he knows that. I don't think he's put all that completely together yet. I think that comes as a result of his little conversation with Dumbledore. Yeah. So, he sees Snape get killed. Snape says, look at me. And he gives Harry his memories. And we get the prince's tale. And what do we see? We see Lily and Severus as children playing we see them growing up together, playing. What part of the tracks do you think Lily grew up on? The right side, the nice side. Snape is where? It spinner's end. Okay? For all the weaving and all the deceit and all the plots and all the conspiracies have their ultimate end. Okay? And we see all of the conversation between Snape and Dumbledore. And finally we see Dumbledore tell Snape when Snape asks, after that long conversation with Dumbledore and Snape, you've kept him alive so he can die at the right moment. Don't be shocked, Severus. How many men and women have you watched die? 
Lately, only those whom I could not save. I have spied for you and lied for you, put myself in mortal danger for you, and now you've been rammed like a pig for slaughter? Well, are you, are you expressing care for the boy? For him? Expecto Patronum and the silver doe. And what does Harry finally realize? It was Snape that sent the doe to show Harry the sword of Godric Gryffindor. After all this time. Okay. Chapter 34. Harry understood at last that he was not supposed to survive. His job was to walk calmly into death's welcoming arms. Along the way, he was to dispose of Voldemort's remaining links to life, so that when at last he flung himself across Voldemort's path and did not raise a wand to defend himself, the end would be clean. The, uh, the job that ought to have been done in Godric's Hollow would be finished. Neither would live. Neither could survive. Okay? What Harry thinks is going to happen, at this point possibly, is that when Voldemort kills him, Harry, he, Voldemort, will also die. This cold-blooded walk to his own destruction would require a different kind of bravery. And then we're told, slowly as he sits up, why had he never appreciated what a miracle he was. Brain and nerve and bounding heart. Harry had never considered what a miracle it was to be alive. That's the significance of that Christmas morning when he's on that hillside and he's looking out and he's got the most beautiful view in the world. And what does he think? He is an insignificant speck on an insignificant planet in an insignificant galaxy, in an insignificant portion of an insignificant universe. And now he thinks, man, it's a miracle that anything exists at all. And I am a miracle, a living, breathing, walking, talking miracle. But he thinks it must end, it must end. And so he goes on, he sees Neville, he tells Neville, you know that snake Voldemort has? Kill it, <laughs> if you get the chance. And he keeps walking, and he tells himself, you know, it's not so hard. Excuse me, it's not so easy getting ready to die. Page somewhere around 197 or so. And he thinks, well, this is the close, <laughs> this is it. Kisses the snitch, the elder, the resurrection stone, cracks down the middle, and there they are. James, exactly the same height as Harry, wearing the clothes in which he died, hair untidy, ruffled. Ceres, tall and handsome, younger by far than Harry would seen him. Lupin, younger too, much less shabby. Lily, her smile widest of all. Why? Way to go, son. You figured it out. What does that tell us? This isn't a pale imitation. This is the soul of Lily Potter. You've been so brave. James, you're nearly there, very close. We're so proud of you. Harry, does it hurt? Notice, he's cutting to the chase. He's got an important... What's it feel like to die? <laughs> Serious, not at all. It's quicker and easier than falling asleep. Okay? Dying's a breeze. And he will want it to be quick. He wants it over. Harry, I didn't want you to die. Any of you. I'm sorry. Remus, I'm sorry. I'm sorry too. Sorry I will never know him. But he'll know why I died. And I hope he will understand. I was trying to make a world in which he could live a happier life. Remember the quote from Edmund Burke? All that is necessary for evil to thrive is for good men to do nothing. Well, here's a good man who stood up and died. 
All right. So here he goes into the forest. Bzz. And he sits up. His body appeared unscathed. He touched his face. He's not wearing glasses anymore. We're going to run out of time. So why is he not wearing glasses? He doesn't need them. What's he wearing? Nothing. nothing. Until he realizes he's wearing nothing. And then he's like, oh. and he has clothes. Harry, but you're dead. He sees Voldemort. Yes, then I'm dead too. Maybe. <laughs> not, not. But I meant to let him kill me. And that will, I think, have made all the difference. Harry meant to let Voldemort kill him. That's why he's not fully dead. Okay? So he and Dumbledore talk a long time. We're going to skip a whole bunch. Okay, notice where Harry thinks he is. King's Cross. Dumbledore's really. Hmm, that's interesting. Notice the name of the place. King's Cross. Like the sword hilt. That is a cross. Okay. And notice what else Harry sees. There's something over there making a noise. And what does Harry want to do? Even when he's dead, he wants to help. Okay. So Dumbledore says he couldn't be trusted with power. Page 720. And Harry goes back. And what does Narcissa Malfoy do? He's dead. So here he goes, and he finally confronts Voldemort. Page 738. Don't you get it? I was ready to die to stop you hurting these people. But you did not. Yeah, but I meant to. And that's what did it. In other words, what does Harry's death become for everybody? Voldemort can't hurt them. He has become Savior Potter. Haven't you noticed none of the spells you put on them are binding? You can't torture them. You can't touch them. You don't learn from your mistakes, Riddle, do you? You do? Yes, I dare. I know things you don't know, Tom Riddle. I know lots of important things. Okay? And so what does he offer him? Redemption. He offers him a chance for what? To make the crying, mewling thing in King's Cross whole. Whole. He says, Snape wasn't your man. Snape helped me. Okay? It's your last chance, Harry says. It's all you've got left. I've seen what you'll be otherwise. Be a man. Notice, be a man. Try for a remorse. It takes a man, a real man, not being sexist, okay, to really feel remorse. You dare? Yes, I dare. Yes, I dare. Your wand isn't working properly, is it? Why? Because it doesn't answer to you. It answers to me. So it comes down to this, doesn't it? Does the wand in your hand know its last master was disarmed? Because if it does, I'm the true master. Avada Kedav, expelli. One dies, one walks away. The sun rose steadily over Hogwarts, and the great hall blazed with life and light. Now, my opinion, she should have ended there. Not 19 years later. Why do we have the 19 years later, however? People want closure. Is it closure? No. no. Why else? Happy ending. Why else? It's like the cycle begins again. We have little Kitty Lupin going off to school. Yeah, Teddy too. Teddy Lupin. He's 19 at this point. But he's going off. Oh, no, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, the other one. Okay. Why else? Because we see the respect of Draco and Harry. Draco tips his hat to Harry. 
Good. That's significant. That's important. What's that showing? Hogwarts isn't downhearted anymore. Slytherin is part of the school. And I don't mean part just one of the four houses. I mean the school is unified again. Okay, you've got your exams.